Okay, so let's continue. Next would be getting new batteries for my remote. Um, next would be uh, having a look at uh, hardware and software. So on the one hand, we have the traditional desktop PCs and up to a, to a certain point also laptops. So we have very high-end uh, processors. We have usually have a separate uh, graphics processor, GPU. Um, we have a modul modular design where you can swap out components, at least up to a point. With laptops, it's not so uh, well uh, solved anymore, but you can still, for example, upgrade the RAM or put in a different uh, disk. With a, with a desktop computer, you can even put in a different GPU and so on. Um, these can have uh, hundreds of watts of power consumption, especially the GPUs, so you also have lots of thermal issues. You need to get rid of all the, the waste heat generated by those watts. Um, and up to now, the, uh, the, the CPU architecture is mostly x86, so Intel and everything related. So that's the one uh, side of the equation. And uh, if you look at input and output, you could say that you only have very few input and output channels, but very high performance. So we have a, a screen with high resolution, we have keyboard and mouse. Um, maybe more recently we have uh, virtual reality. You might want to count that as a, as a separate channel, but it's still a single channel with a very high performance. And to show you what I mean by high performance, I've uh, found a nice video which shows what's actually possible with keyboard and mouse. This is from uh, some professional gamers from uh, Korea, and they are able to do up to, yeah, let's say, 300 actions per minute, so like five actions per second. I hope this is visible. So let's see how that actually looks. This is probably even more than uh, 300 per minute, as far as I can tell. It's not even... Yeah, okay, I think you get the idea. Um, I've linked the video so you can watch it uh, later if you want to. But you have uh, very, very high performance with mm, yeah, kind of a limited, limited set of channels. You have just keyboard and mouse, and if you train long enough and uh, use it, uh, often enough, then you are able to really put in a very large amount of information uh, into a very short time. Okay, so on the other hand now, we have mobile devices, which have uh, a different focus. So here the focus is often on energy efficiency. And for that reason, we have a different, uh, different system architecture. We often have so-called system on chips, SOCs, where everything is integrated into one single chip. So you can't also easily swap out, uh, for example, the GPU because it's simply integrated into one, uh, one package with everything else. Um, what's not integrated most of the time is uh, RAM and ROM. Uh, does maybe anyone have an idea why? So why, of course you can get system on chips where everything is really integrated into one device, but that's not usually the way it is in a, in a mobile phone, for example. There you have the storage is still separate. Any idea why? Yes? Um, well, it's still soldered down, so it's very difficult to repair. Now the reason is, uh, I think the reason is mostly because then you have uh, uh, more flexibility in actually designing the device, because RAM and ROM take up by far the most space on the chip. So if you want like uh, two gigabytes of RAM and 16 gigabytes of flash, they take up a, a lot more area, um, purely in terms of chip area, than the CPU and GPU do. Um, so if you would integrate everything into one, one package, you would need to have a really huge chip and then you wouldn't, uh, you would get a lot, a lot more uh, errors during manufacturing, for example. Um, so it's easier to separate in, uh, into uh, RAM and ROM at least because they are 
really large and manufacture them separately. And also then you get, uh, for example, you can simply leave out part of the chips on the device and sell it for a lower price because you have one with only half the storage, for example. Um, here we are mostly dealing with the ARM architecture. That's not something we will have a lot, lot, uh, lot of contact with, but again, this is an architecture with, which comes from the mobile and embedded uh, area, so it's a little better optimized for power consumption. Of course, now you can also get um, smartphones and tablets with Intel processors, so this is also kind of converging. Um, ARM uh, is getting more and more um, performance uh, optimized. On the other hand, Intel is getting more uh, energy optimized. So there's not so such big of a difference anymore. Um, and if you look at I.O. now, um, relative to the, the 300 APM on keyboard and mouse we just saw, we now have more channels to put data in and out of the device. We have a touchscreen camera, we have vibration, we have audio, um, and so on. But each of those probably has less performance than the uh, channels we saw on the desktop computer. So the screen is smaller and has uh, lower resolution uh, often. Um, the uh, touchscreen uh, probably won't allow you to, to do 300 uh, actions per minute. Does anybody have an idea why it probably won't work? So why couldn't you play like StarCraft, uh, like the, the, this professional player did on a touch screen? What would you say? Yeah. I think they often have an arbitrary level to compute for the action connection. For example, if there is a question of 150 milliseconds to see if it's a tap or if it does some sort of swipe. Oh, okay, yes, that's a good point. So that's a, limit, that's a limiting factor. Anything else you can think of? Maybe the graphics chip will have specific resolution to the input and the graphics user will see it and can spread all the bandwidth back to the user who can see it. That's a good point. That's called occlusion uh, in that context often. Or, or also, we, and we'll get to that later, the, the so-called fat finger problem. Um, because your finger occludes what you actually want to interact with. One other reason maybe that you, yeah, also. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Also a good point, and somewhat to re related to that, what, what my first idea was is that you don't feel any keys. And that's kind of a prerequisite for actually placing your hand there, that you can feel the divisions between the keys um, without actually pressing them. And on a touch screen, that's not possible. So all of this put together is one of the reasons why um, directly mapping these 300 APM interactions to a mobile device probably won't work. So the way around that usually is in mobile devices is basically to get creative and use more channels, like for example, also use the accelerometer to, uh, uh, to put in data or uh, use the, uh, in a different context, maybe use the GPS location as an input. So you have more channels which each channel, of course, gives you less data into the device, but uh, if you combine them in a, in a creative way, then you can maybe come up with a, a different mode of interaction that's in the, in the uh, if seen as a whole, has a similar bandwidth uh, to the regular keyboard and mouse. But uh, it's maybe more difficult to learn. That's, that depends on what specific combination you are actually dealing with. Okay. So let's continue. Um, there's one idea which uh, some people have been putting out for, for the last few years as kind of a convergence in terms of hardware is to have one single device which can deal with everything you want to, uh, you want to do. So this is actually a still ongoing campaign on, on Indiegogo. So this, they, they collected a lot of money like, I don't know, one and a half million dollars uh, to, pr to produce this device. They're still working on it. 
I don't know if they will actually succeed. So the central idea is that you just have everything, like every, all the computing power and so is in your watch. And uh, everything else, like the phone, the tablet, the keyboard, even that, that uh, TV dongle, all of that is just wirelessly connected to, to the watch. And all the display uh, information is sent by some kind of, of wireless protocol to the screens. Um, it's a neat idea, but um, so far nobody has actually seen a working prototype. Let's see if they can actually come up with one at some point. So they have a lot of money to, to uh, do that now. Um, again, I think the idea is quite kind of neat, but I'm not so sure if it's actually feasible in practice because to, to actually transfer the um, the whole image contents uh, in real time from one screen to another uh, actually takes quite a lot of bandwidth. And especially it takes a very stable um, um, wireless connection. So if, you're, uh, if your phone screen keeps freezing all the time, then you wouldn't probably want to use this kind of device. Yes, please. Exactly, okay. that's the, the central idea. So everything, CPU, RAM, storage is in the watch and the other things are just displays with a receiver and a touch screen maybe. And everything is uh, sent uh, wirelessly. Nice concept. I'm still having an eye on that to see if they can actually produce a prototype at some point. I'm still a little skeptical, but um, let's, let's wait and see. Okay, so so much for hardware. Now let's have a look into um, software. So in 2007, 2008 maybe, we had this so-called smartphone revolution, which was mostly triggered by the uh, iPhone. Um, and right now we have uh, smart, so a software market for mobile devices, which is mostly split in two. We have maybe 20 or 30 percent market share of uh, Apple and iOS at the high end, and we have the rest mostly uh, down to, to Android across the whole spectrum. So I've mentioned it earlier, you can get decent Android devices for 100 euros, which is um, really quite impressive given what's actually inside those devices. Um, I think for Apple devices you have to start at like four or 500 euros, so that's quite a different market segment. Um, the interesting thing is, and also why this is called a, a revolution, is because Android and iOS completely managed to, to roll up the entire market in uh, about two years. I'll show you a graph uh, next. Um, we have lots of smaller yeah, contenders right now. For example, Windows Phone is in the third place, I guess, with something around maybe five or, or seven percent. Um, and there's even smaller ones like uh, Firefox OS, Ubuntu Touch and so on. I'll give you a brief overview over this, those in a minute. Um, and one of the most common aspects of all these mobile operating systems right now is that they have a centralized and more or less uh, well-guarded uh, store for software. So um, you can't uh, just download anything off the internet. On Android, it sort of works after you enable a few, a few checkboxes. On iOS, it's uh, even a little more complicated. Um, so the manufacturers really try to keep everything under wraps. Only software they have approved should, in theory, run on the devices. And that's across just about all of the operating systems. So a um, bit of a historical view. This is worldwide uh, smartphone sales. It only goes up to 2013, but uh, m it mostly looked similar for the last, uh, last few years. So um, what's interesting is that at some point in 2007, we had uh, almost 17% market share from Symbian. Who, who has ever heard of Symbian? <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> five people. Um, that was the dominant smartphone operating system until iOS and Android came out and it really took only uh, four, four years for it to be more or less completely wiped out. So um, it was produced by Nokia. Um, 
yeah, was the standard until 2009, maybe. From then on, uh, it, it went, went more or less out of production. I'm not 100% sure if you still can get any Symbian devices. Maybe there are some, some leftover niche devices where it's still being used, but um, again, it's, it's basically dead. And it, it, uh, it went dead in a very short time frame, actually. So what else do we have? Just a brief overview. We have, for example, BlackBerry operating system. Also very small market share. It's a bit more popular in, in big companies. Um, so for example, Siemens or I don't know, uh, these companies often got BlackBerry devices also falling market share. Um, they tried to kind of get around that by uh, in, recently enabling Android applications to run on BlackBerry devices. Um, but it doesn't appear to have helped a lot, so uh, still, still basically on, on its way out. Um, then we have Windows 10. This is, uh, as I've mentioned, is right now the only really serious contender to, to iOS and Android. Still has a very small market share, despite a very aggressive marketing. Um, so there's also kind of a bit of confusion. Uh, is it Windows 10? Is it Windows Phone? Is it Windows Mobile? So it's basically changed its, its name like every year. Um, so in the very beginning, there was Windows CE. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. That the, the, was the very first mobile uh, operating system by Microsoft. And that was really kind of a flop because it really more or less took the exact Windows 95 interface and tried to put it on mobile devices. So you even had little windows which you could move around, which wasn't very, uh, very user friendly. Um, uh, so Windows CE kind of evolved into Windows Phone, um, which is uh, the one you can see here, which then again sort of branched out into uh, Windows 10, and right now it's called Windows 10 Mobile. So the long-term goal by Microsoft is that every device runs some kind of Windows and that they are actually compatible to each other. So you can have one single app which runs on your mobile device, which has a mobile-friendly interface like this, this tiles-based one. And then um, when you move to a, to a bigger computer or uh, even just connect a bigger screen to your mobile phone, and a keyboard, then it changes into some kind of desktop-like user interface where you can work with keyboard and mouse. So that's an interesting concept, but uh, it's still in, in the very early stages, I guess. Um, then, of course, we have iOS. I've already mentioned that briefly. Um, most people are kind of familiar with it. Uh, it's yeah, the, the high-end spectrum right now of the market. And what's interesting to, to note is that it's actually also based, like quite a lot of the other ones, uh, it's also based on open source technology. So it's based on uh, the Darwin kernel, which is also part of macOS. Um, and this in turn is based on BSD, which is an open source operating system. But of course, with modifications made by Apple, so you can't actually really change the, um, the operating system on, uh, on an iPhone. Um, in contrast to the other uh, operating systems here, we have a very specific language which is just for iOS development mostly, which is Objective-C and re more recently Swift. Um, the other ones use more general purpose languages. Um, then Android, of course, uh, probably just about everyone, anyone here in the room has some kind of Android device. Um, it's also open source. It's a bit more open source than iOS. <laughs> so, bless you. <laughs> so, um, you can, in theory at least, uh, build the entire software stack on your Android phone from scratch and, uh, and change whatever you like. So, from the very bottom up to the top. In practice, this only works for, uh, really works for the Nexus device series by Google and some select others. The reason is that many manufacturers, especially in the, in the low price uh, segment, they don't really 
uh, release all the source, um, the source code you would need to build the entire operating system. In theory, they are le legally obliged to do that, but uh, in practice, uh, it's very hard to force them to do that, uh, so it doesn't really happen that often. So if you really want to do low-level experimentation with Android, which is, again, possible in theory, then uh, you're best off with one of the, the official Google devices because for those you can really get the whole software stack from the very bottom to the top um, as open source. With one single exception, and this is the apps made by Google themselves, like Google Maps, Gmail, and so on. These you can only get as uh, yeah, binary packages which you have to install from the, from the store. Um, what's also important to note is that even though you program Android with Java, um, what's actually running on the devices is not a Java virtual machine in itself. It's called Delvic. So uh, still using Java bytecode, but with a different kind of interpreter. So you can't just take a class file which you get from, from regular Java and move that over to an Android phone. You at least have to recompile it. So there's a bit of a difference here. Um, to round things off, maybe a brief look at uh, one or two um, really, really um, niche operating systems for mobile devices. For example, there's Firefox OS, which has just recently been discontinued, but it's also open source, so maybe some people will still continue to work on that. So this is uh, targeted towards very low cost uh, devices. And uh, the idea is that you basically have the HTML engine from Firefox for the entire user interface. So everything is more or less written in HTML5 um, and JavaScript. But right now, as I've mentioned, it's kind of stalled. So mm, let's see if, the, uh, if this gets revived at, the, at some point. And finally, what's also maybe interesting to keep an eye on uh, is Ubuntu Touch. Um, you can actually now buy devices uh, with uh, Ubuntu Touch, which is also, of course, a Linux-based operating system. And what they aim for is, again, this concept of convergence. So you have only one single device, and once you connect a larger screen and the keyboard, maybe, then it simply switches to, the, uh, to a Linux desktop, and you can continue working with your applications only now instead of a mobile-specific uh, interface, they will now use a, uh, a desktop uh, interface. And you can take, take advantage of uh, what you can do with keyboard and mouse, for example, entering text. All right, um, brief summary again. So we have mobile hardware, which is uh, more monolithic, less modular than regular PCs. Um, anyone has a very high level suggestion why that is? So what's, so we have, we have this project ARA, which we looked at, which would be modular. So um, what's the, the big problem probably in actually doing a modular mobile device? So why, why wouldn't, don't I, why can't I just upgrade the RAM on my mobile phone, for example? Mm -hmm. and it money. And if people just buy this model, so they can buy new parts like every year, every while, and mm -hmm. the cost That's definitely one part of it, I guess. So what would you say? The architecture of the actual phone is pretty much not meant to be disassembled that much, like the modules that you have in a phone. Yeah, um, well, that's kind of the point. Um, what what would you need to actually make it that way? So what do you think? If you would want something like the project era, what would you what would you need? Excuse me. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a very good point. You need to standardize it. So even even if you want to. Um, 
to, so if you want to maybe just go into a store and buy a different piece of, of RAM for your phone, for a laptop it works because they all use the same connector, but for a phone it doesn't. And maybe the underlying, so I guess there's maybe two underlying reasons why that is, and one is simply cost. So even if I just add one single connector, uh, like that's maybe 10, 10 cents, um, even 10 cent additional price will already uh, kind of cut into my profits if I'm selling the entire phone for 100 euros or maybe even 50 euros. So um, yeah, you can actually get a, an Android phone for, for 50 euros, which isn't really great, but still it has everything which we, which we just talked about. And even if I add just 10 cents for a connector, then that will already either drive my profits down or the price up so it's not done. And the other thing is um, uh, space. If I have to, to uh, uh, add a connector at some point, it will take a little, up a little space. And of course, if I have many of them, they will take up more space. And um, I can't, uh, I, I have an additional design constraint, so to speak. So uh, for example, if I have a, a connector for the RAM module, then I would have to route all of the RAM uh, uh, data lines to that connector. And otherwise, if I have everything on one board, then I can distribute stuff uh, more easy um, and uh, use the space I have in a more efficient way. And usually, uh, people are trying to get phones down in size, um, so even only to put in a bigger battery. Even if you have a, like a, don't know, five or six inch phone, then people still try to uh, shrink the components like the CPU and so on down as much as possible uh, so you can put in a bigger battery and people get longer run times. So it's always a trade-off and in this case the trade-off is away from um, modular devices. Um, any other questions about this part? Any other comments? 